Hello, everybody, and welcome again to Beyond Black and White, our Bible study about the history of literalism. And today, we're going to begin a shift in our focus away from just sort of a, a history of how different biblical interpretation approaches have developed into doing some work together to interpret and experiment and think through how might we approach scripture beyond a simple um, exposition of what it's saying. How might we let scripture enliven, illuminate, um, help us imagine ways of being beyond what we might be experiencing on an everyday basis? So just a quick review, our goals together, we're going to learn about the Bible, about various histories related to the Bible. We're going to do some unlearning, challenging our assumptions about what the Bible is or what a particular uh, scripture or passage means. And we're going to empower. And that's really what the, the latter part of today's class will be illustrating and giving you a taste of, of what it looks like to be empowered readers of the Bible, to uh, imagine what it might have to say to us as we imagine our own voices in it. And I'll get a, a, into more of what that means in just a little bit. First though, quick review. The last time we got together, we really focused in on how the European Enlightenment totally reshaped the way that um, most readers of the Bible approached reading the Bible, regardless of what end of the ideological uh, or intellectual spectrum you may be on. We talked about how on the one hand, we have a kind of the, what's known now as the historical critical approach which is the more liberal approach of looking at the Bible, looking at the texts, trying to understand how they came to be, trying to understand their historical cultural significance in their particular context. On the other side of the spectrum, we talked about the more literalist approach to reading the Bible and what is known in academic circles as the historical grammatical approach, which focuses mainly on two different things. One, the authorial intent. And so what was the intention of the author when they wrote a particular passage? And then also what meanings might have been signified to the original audience for that text? And so, on the surface, that seems simple enough to understand. Last time we talked about how that is even reminiscent of some current um, kind of constitutional approaches and how there's this thing called originalism where you have to interpret a given constitutional provision according to the audience of the folks who first heard it or passed it or what have you. And so what we discussed though also was how on either end of that spectrum, we're still in the place of a rational, logical approach to interpreting scripture. That doesn't mean that the results are logical in the sense that they make sense, that they are correct, that they are whatever. But it does mean that logic is the means by which, rather than some other human faculty, Logic is the means by which we try to achieve and attain an explanation for what a given text means. We just have really different tools on this spectrum for how to do that. Any questions at this point about that kind of quick summary of our last discussion? Um, questions or, or comments? I just want to know what's for brunch there. We've got Somebody cooking in the back there over at Marsh's. That looks great. I want to know what's happening back there. There's a good shot. We've got some good activity going on. Susan's eating. They're cooking back there. Yeah. Well, we'll let silence be the answer to that question, Keith. And so um, any other questions I, about the content? Yes, John. Well, I was wondering... Uh, well about the content and the uh, authors who wrote it 
uh, is there in the first behind, beforehand some kind of idea about divine deliverance to these people? Yeah, it's a good question, John. And that's definitely the case, particularly on that kind of other end of the spectrum, the historical, grammatical, literal interpretation. Part of the, the logic that that interpretation is based on is that you can dive into authorial intent in order to understand what a given passage means because there was a single author. For example, at the first five books of Moses, as, as they are known, um, you know, another, the other side of that conversation would say, this is a composition. It's made up of different voices uh, speaking at different time periods, even that editors have put together. On the other end of the spectrum, it's no, you can reconcile those inconsistencies um, in a whole variety of ways. But at the end of the day, it was written by a single author inspired by God. And that inspiration goes beyond the author and in fact governs and influences and shapes the whole project of yeah. compiling the Bible as well. So yeah, that's a really big piece of things, John, for us to keep in mind. We're going to look today at um, Genesis chapters 1 and 2, and we're going to dive into some more specifics around that issue in particular. Was there someone else who had a question or a, a comment? I see Marsha's crew getting ready to unmute. Okay. There we go. <laughs> the space bar wouldn't work. Um, I, I wonder if the um, the critical approach, the critical contextual historical approach, doesn't subsume the gram his grammatical approach because knowing how the text would have been read by the earlier readers, and actually knowing how it would have been read by readers throughout history seems to me to be a kind of critical part of understanding it contextually. So it seems like that approach subsumes the other. Yeah, absolutely. Just thinking about the sheer, I mean, even the names, historical, critical versus historical, grammatical, I think that you could certainly say, given the focus on context, that the, that the historical critical approach includes that other approach the main difference ends up being on how much of a person's beliefs, religious beliefs shape the way that they um, even begin to answer the question of how these texts came to be. And so in the historical grammatical approach, rather than looking beyond the context of the text itself, rather than looking at um, kind of the, the the compositional history, for instance, there's just look a look at the language itself. And, and again, with the idea that that language that we're looking at was inspired by God. And so I think if you take out the devotional aspect, then yeah, they could sort of be on a much narrower spectrum, perhaps. But um, there's this attention to language as the, the beginning and end, really, of the whole interpretive project and with the added um, condition that the language itself was inspired by God. So let's dive into looking at the creation story. Before we look at the text themselves, what do you all remember about what the creation story includes. You don't have to give a whole detailed chronological account, but just when you're asked about or you think about, as I'm sure you often do, what the creation story is or was, what comes to mind? Tony, I'm actually uh, reminded of that man who was harassing me at the Cooper Young Fest about mm -hmm. the, um, when I said there were two um, creation stories and he was like no there's not what are you talking about and then of course I couldn't remember what were the two I I was like I know there's two I can't quote you on it but it's a thing um and so 
if you could maybe give me the answer to that so I will be better prepared next time an evangelist accosts me, I would appreciate it. <laughs> you got it, Susan. We're definitely going to talk about that today. Yeah. So there's there's two accounts debatable to what extent they are separate and independent. However, yes, um, there are two moments in Genesis where there's an account of how the universe began. Okay. So we'll dive into that for sure. What about other folks? What else do you remember from the highlights of the creation story? So you've got the Adam. Oh, sorry. I just blurted in. Yeah, go ahead, Gail. <laughs> you got the Adam and Eve story, and then you've got the sort of the cosmology of how sky and earth and growing things and finally animals got, got created. Yeah. And it's separate from the Adam and Eve and the paradise and the tree of good and evil and all that moral stuff. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that, Gail. We've got um, kind of this this whole kind of moral tale about what happens with Adam and Eve. And then we've got a kind of a numeration of the different steps of the creation of the universe. Yeah, Julia, what were you thinking about? Well, I, kind of on that is I was going to say that sort of that the importance that I always felt growing up that first it was this, then it was this, then it was this. And as a child, that's very appealing. We, you know, we like seeing that. Then, then we built this, this, the foundation first in the sky and blah, blah, blah. So I just felt that was a huge importance that I felt. Um, yeah, the orderedness of it. The orderliness, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah John. Uh, the thing that strikes to answer your question was uh, it says five times, I believe, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. Uh oh, right. <laughs> what? Why are they eating the fruit? I told them not to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks That's for right. that. Yeah, yeah. That refrain that the Lord saw, or God saw, what God had made, and saw that it was good. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's let's dive into these. Um, <clears throat> To Genesis parts of Genesis 1 and uh, chapter 1 and, and chapter 2 because it, this is going to help us understand how these two ends of the spectrum that we were just describing um, respond to possible contradictions or inconsistencies or what have you. So um, here is an excerpt from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formula, formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And then I just kind of created a, a little list here of the order, uh, it's light and dark, also day and night, then God creates sky, by separating land and sea. And then God creates celestial bodies by putting lights in the dark. Then God creates, um, oh, and in land and sea, God also creates plants at that moment. Then God creates animals and then God creates humans. And then here's what the passage about humans looks like in Genesis chapter one. Would someone be willing to read this? I will. Then God said, let us make humankind. I don't know what that C means. In, it's copyrighted humankind in our <laughs> image and according to our likeness and let them have a dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Beautiful. Thank you, Keith. Reactions to, to this, if any questions. I can say really quickly that those little letters you're seeing there, C and D and E, those are editorial notes about translation. 
the, uh, in particular where it says humankind, the word used there is the Hebrew word Adam, which is the word for man or person or um, is also in some cases a proper name, which we will hear later on. When reading it, that word subdue really uh, just jumped out uh, having to mouth that down in the last paragraph. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Subdue, dominion, these sorts of words um, lead many folks to believe that human beings relationship to nature is one of dominance. And so that that can bring us into a whole other um, line of conversation. Um, but there's also moments here where um, there's a sense of God creating human beings in God's own likeness, male and female both. And so there's a sense here of a kind of equality that you that that we could talk more about. Um, any other questions or comments about this passage? Well, just it it sort of seems to imply then that the image of God is like humans is human like and so i think that gets it that gets it out of some of the more dynamic images of god as as a as a mover or as a as a a source of of power and strength and makes it more like us which then would you know, get you in trouble when you got to chapter 2 yeah, that's that's an interesting point, Gail. And it brings up the question of what does likeness or image mean? Mm. And this is something that theologians have debated forever, really. Um, and that image maybe just means rationality. That's how human beings are like God. Or image means um, a kind of baseline goodness. That's what God gives to human beings. Um, and, or, and then you've got some folks who think it's, it's really about even physicality, that God is a, sort of a human looking person in the sky. So there's so many ways that we can look at any one of these words um, or, or suggestions in this passage and try to start thinking through what they might mean for our faith. So we've got this account in Genesis 1. Let's so take a look. Uh, be fruitful and multiply. Isn't that why some like denominations don't believe in birth control? There are lots of reasons for that. But yes, this is, <laughs> this is, um, this is certainly a moment in which we get the sense of what human beings function in the world is, um, and it is to procreate. But there are other places in Paul and even in some of the Gospels where um, people start to get the sense or start arguing that the only function of sex is procreation. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's a moment that I think for a lot of us um, kind of rings in our ears, be, be fruitful and multiply. It's a command that God gives to human beings that um, has, it has some staying power in the sense that it gets talked about quite a bit. Looking at chapter two, this is from Genesis verses four through eight. Would someone else read this? I can read it. Yeah, thank you, Susan. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, oh, I was about to say five, <laughs> <laughs> when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Thank you so much. Okay, so we go from that moment in Genesis 2 
to reading on down to 22. And I'll just go ahead and read this. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of the man's ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Okay. Genesis 1, we have a kind of chronology of the steps of creation. And it culminates in God creating male and female, out of God's image. Then in Genesis chapter 2, we have a reiteration of all of those steps. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, no plants, we have a kind of a rehearsal in a way. And then when it comes to the question of the creation of humankind, we get a different narrative. We've got, rather than God creating male and female in God's own image, what we have here is specific people. We have Adam that God creates out of the earth. And then we have woman God creates out of Adam's rib cage. What are y'all's thoughts on this? What do you notice? What are your questions? What are you thinking? Isn't there some version where she's not made out of the rib? No. Well, I guess you could make the argument that in Genesis 1, um, you just have the creation of male and female. Um, but yeah, no, in the in in Genesis 2, uh, well in, in Genesis, that's the that's the story. Oh, okay. Yeah. It, it just seems so obvious that these are two different stories out of different, probably cultural time periods, because uh, it's very patriarchal when you get to chapter two. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a really different. Not only is the order of creation different, but um, the instructions end up being different, too. Well, that's what I was going to speak to. I mean, in the first one, I mean, it seems that procreation is why there were male and female. How else are you going to procreate? But that in the second one, Probably it's Genesis. <laughs> but, but but the second one is is more about relationship. Um, that that in my mind, it's about him being lonely, and um and and also not not just that woman is secondary to man or came from it, but but that she is equal to uh him in a way that provides companionship mm -hmm. uh, you know not to be subservient but to be a, a full companion and so that's that's the one i like mm -hmm. <laughs> now tony these are coming from two different parts of the bible is that right they're both yep. from the book of genesis two different chapters though back to back chapters back to back right after the other one right after the other so and why so, does like that evangelical person only kind of acknowledge this story and not the other one? Yeah, it's that's, that's <laughs> a great question. <clears throat> and we're going to get to that. Before we do, though, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the 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 idea that these are from two different places, these these stories. Um, and where that comes from is not only the content in English of of what's um, what we're seeing here happening and so why would there be these two why would we need genesis 2 if we have genesis 1 um and so the, the reason why there's a sense that they are from two different sources again in addition to the content in english is the use of some language in hebrew and so if you look at chapter 1 in each of the accounts, we see God, God created, 
God said, God blessed, God said. And then in Genesis 2, what do you notice? In the day that the Lord God made, the Lord God had not caused the Lord. And so what we're seeing here is the reason that word Lord is inserted is because it's an English translation of the Hebrew word Yahweh. And so when, it, when the word Lord appears in most places, particularly in the Hebrew scriptures, it is a translation of the word Yahweh, which is often why you see it in capital letters. And, um, and it has sort of an echo even, the capital L-O-R-D, of the way that the word Yahweh is written in Hebrew with four letters. And then in Hebrew um, and also in Arabic, the way that vowel sounds, so some vowel sounds get, um, get inserted into a word is through apostrophes and, and other kind of minor um, symbols that don't always appear because folks who know these languages have facility and know how to pronounce a word. So what the, uh, the, the theory is behind the historical critical, we're on that side of the spectrum now, um, the documentary hypothesis is that a, um, a compiler, an editor, maybe in the, the reign of King Josiah, somewhere in the 5th, 6th, 7th century. Again, there's no real certainty around this, um, but that a person or a team of people actually put these texts together um, and brought either through scrolls that they had already and were working with and kind of created a, a single narrative or through oral traditions that they wrote down and just decided to include more than one. And so in this documentary hypothesis, there are, there's debate around how many documents there are that are compiled in the Bible. Um, but in general, there are at least two um, or, or, well, three really, that are kind of generally understood to exist. And so the first is the priestly source. And that is what many folks believe Genesis chapter one is. And um, that whole elaborate ordered schema of the creation of the universe, then later when the priestly source comes back in the Genesis story during the flood, what folks argue is that what happens in the flood is that God undoes creation. That there's a moment in the, in the first chapter of Genesis in this priestly source where God creates a separation of the waters and creates the sky with this dome. And so the priestly source um, suggests that during the flood, God basically dissolved the barrier. And then suddenly now all of the water was back on the surface of the planet. And so, um, you know, that following that line through is interesting and scholars have done it pretty convincingly to show where these different documents show up in the text. The other text is the, called the Deuteronomist. And that is essentially the theory is that the person who composed Deuteronomy also edited um, or had versions of various texts in the Hebrew scriptures that got inserted to other parts of the Bible as well. And then lastly, there is... I think, Tony, are you saying the Deuteronomist one was the Genesis 2? No, the, so the Deuteronomist one um, was definitely the book of Deuteronomy, but then made its way into other places. But in Genesis 2, the... Uh, the consensus is among folks who ascribe to this hypothesis that that is actually the Yahwist account. And that is the account in these documents where the word Yahweh shows up in ways that it doesn't in other places. And so that's the account that, um, that Genesis 2 is thought to have come from. And there's a fourth one that many folks um, are, are sort of on the fence about where uh, there's the word Elohim shows up as a way to refer to God, and it's been called the Eloist. But um, many think that 
that the Elois and the Yahwist are maybe actually the same editor. Um, but again, this is this is hypothesis, right? Um, and it's based on, I think, some pretty convincing evidence, but there's no way to know for sure that this is what took place. And so other folks make arguments based in logic. Um, whether or not we think that logic is faulty is a whole other conversation, but it's meant to be based in logic, that this is in fact a single narrative. And what we're seeing in these two accounts is an elaboration that Genesis 2 elaborates on Genesis 1. And so in Genesis 1, we're getting a story about the creation of the universe. And then in Genesis 2, we're getting a story about the creation of sin. And so how sin comes and infiltrates into the creation history. And so there's not a difference, um, actually, what we're, not a contradiction. In fact, what we're seeing is just an elaboration in the way that an author or a storyteller or, um, or, or anyone might kind of reiterate some points that they had made earlier on in order to develop a particular point. And folks get into the weeds even more than, um, than I just described, but at, that is at least one way that folks attempt to reconcile those contradictions. What thoughts do y'all have? questions i i don't understand the significance of the insertion of the yahweh concept in in genesis one what what was the original um yeah that's a good question or what, what, but why is there a differentiation or why do we care we care because the Again, according to the folks who would ascribe to the documentary hypothesis, um, the, the, the elaboration of Judaism as a monotheistic religion took time. And so there were, according to these folks, various cults of religious practice that people who understood themselves to be Israelites um, engaged in. And so Yahweh, was a God, not the only God. And so part of the significance is that what the argument is we, that we see happening in the composition project and the revision project is creating a really clear sense of a monotheistic people. Okay. And so, um, because there are other ancient creation stories that have some resonances with this, but they often involve gods who are warring against each other. There's a Sumerian creation myth where there was a male god and a female god. The male god dominates and kills and dismembers the female god, and that is, and out of that god's body comes the earth. So this is an, a, this is an attempt to give identity in a way that um, kind of distinguishes the Israelites. And so the argument in kind of tracing where the, Yah the word Yahweh shows up is, um, again, an attempt to understand some of these possible dissonances in the text. I, but I don't know what word was used for God in Hebrew in chapter one. That's a good question. I'll have to look that up. I just so, did. And uh, it says to be is the uh, Hebrew translation. In English, it's master. Okay, interesting. Thank you, Diane. So are you saying that when Yahweh shows up, then we're grappling with the Israelites considering themselves a monotheistic group? Yeah, I, th I mean, the priestly source also is contending with that, but giving God a name giving God an identity um, was significant in the sense that it, even looking at the Ten Commandments, right? You shall have no other gods before me. 
it's it's really a process of trying to say this is the only god that matters and in fact if you worship other gods as we see in in various stories in the hebrew scripture it will bring calamity on your people and and in english then lord god is the monotheistic god that's right lord is the way that um i don't know when i assume with king james is is how that word got interpreted um and and how it continues to show up do, do you remember i don't this is random but when we uh, heard padrick otuma last year he does not use the word lord because it has colonial I, implications and i was like wow I, you're you're 100 percent why i never connected those two words yeah. it has what implications Imperial, uh, colonial imperialist. He's Irish, so he doesn't, you know, Lord would be like the Lord of the Manor. It was a, I mean, I guess for people reading the um, King yeah. James version of the Bible, they understood that word to mean master of yeah. something. It sets up the whole hierarchy, you know, that everything starts with God and angels, man, animal, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's really true. And you know, the word this this word Yahweh shows up in different places, and it's not always interpreted or, or translated as Lord. There's the moment when um, God says to Moses, "I am that I am," and there's this sense of God as as being being itself, and the word Yahweh. Just as as you were you were naming Diane means to be, and so um, there's there's a lot of rich and deep kind of linguistic history around uh, that word in particular that in some ways kind of gets flattened out when we think of the use of the word Lord, and particularly in in today's world when um, Lord has a really different set of resonances in um in our minds than than maybe it did certainly for the hebrews who who were writing it um uh, yeah on that on that name yahweh uh, uh father richard Rohr talked to uh some hebrew friends of his and uh where where did this name originate or what's the meaning behind it and he said they told him that uh, like you were saying in the very beginning that uh, when you write Hebrew you leave out the uh, vowels and you're supposed to know how to include them when you're talking and he said Yahweh is the only word that you say without moving your lips and it, he demonstrates by saying In other words, it's breath, the life. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you breathe in, you breathe out, and you pronounce the word. And when you are uh, first get born, you say the name. When you die, you say the name. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really cool. <laughs> that is really cool. And, and what I love about that also, John, is that you're demonstrating a way that we can take a biblical text and deepen its meaning in a way that has resonance for us now. And because that's exactly what the invitation I'm gonna to issue to you in just a minute is. If we're looking at the documentary hypothesis on the one side and the elaboration hypothesis on the other side, we're still in this realm of rational, logical approaches to viewing scripture. We're still in the realm of trying to say, well, based on the evidence, this is what this means, or here's how we reconcile these differences or what have you. And I think for a lot of us, that's how we've been educated to approach scripture, regardless of what end of the spectrum we may have been enculturated with. 
Um, the idea is that these are words, this is a text, and we can derive from it meaning and defensible meaning based on specific evidence. Okay, how else might we think about scripture though? And so what I'm gonna suggest is that perhaps rather than trying to look at a text and squeeze logical meaning out of it or a specific explanation out of it, we might be able to let it shape the way we see the world. Not that we're trying to get a factual account of the origin of the universe, but rather that using the Bible and letting its metaphors and its stories kind of suffuse our experience and our imagination, we might be able to do an entirely different thing, which is to let it show us how to make meaning of the world rather than trying to use it to make sense of the world. Mm. And so one way that that's happened um, is in the Bible itself. So I'm going to share my screen again. This is a passage from Romans. There is another way of describing Jesus that shows up, particularly in Paul's letters, and creates a tradition of thinking about Jesus um, in Christianity. And that is Jesus as the new or the ultimate Adam. And so there's an idea that Adam and the trespass, the sin, the mistake that Adam made of, by eating of the fruit Jesus repairs that, or Jesus shows us a way to repair that original trespass. And so here's, a, here's an excerpt from Romans um, in which Paul kind of talks somewhat about that. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, for all people, that's Adam, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for, that should say, um, that's meant to say all men, all people. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. So again, we have this sense of Paul looking at Adam. Maybe he's thinking this is actual recorded history, but Regardless, what he's suggesting is that it is a way for us to think about what Christianity and what the way of Jesus is all about. Redeeming us, redeeming humanity, redeeming our hearts, our souls, our spirits um, from the trespass that Adam made in the Garden of Eden. So looking a little bit farther into non-biblical texts, this is an illustration of John Milton's Paradise Lost, the epic poem from 17th century um, England in which John Milton kind of rewrites the entire creation story and inserts different characters into it and um, inserts angels and gives names to those angels. And so here we see the fallen Lucifer um, looking at Adam and Eve, plotting how to tempt them into disobeying God. And so here again, we have an attempt to look at uh, the stories of Scripture and to let them ignite imagination, let them ignite creativity, let them ignite a whole new way of thinking about the story itself even. Then I want to show you all this picture. Is anyone familiar with the magazine Lilith? Yeah, seeing some head shake, yeah. Um, so Lilith is a magazine um, based on a character who does not appear in the Bible, but is an elaboration of kind of extra biblical stories that date back um, over a thousand years ago. 
So Lilith is a quarterly magazine exploring the world of the Jewish woman and its moniker now, its sort of tagline is that Lilith is a magazine that is independent, Jewish, and frankly feminist. And so what it comes from is that there's this whole tradition in Judaism in which um, the Okay, there we go. That um, the idea that Eve was not the first woman. And so it's sort of an attempt to reconcile in this creative way the two different Genesis accounts. And so there was a text written in uh, the Middle Ages called the Alphabet of Bin Sirah. And in that, this text gives a whole account of who Lilith is and what her life meant in the creation story. So here's what um, that text has to say. After the Holy One created the first human being, Adam, he said, it is not good for Adam to be alone. He created a woman, also from the earth, and called her Lilith. They quarreled immediately. She said, I will not lie below you. Adam said, I will not lie below you, but above you, for you are fit to be below me and I above you. Lilith responded, we are both equal because we both come from the earth. Neither listened to the other. When Lilith realized what was happening, she pronounced the ineffable name of God and flew off into the air. Adam rose in prayer before the creator saying, the woman you gave me has fled from me. Immediately the Holy One sent three angels after her. The Holy One said to Adam, if she wants to return, all the better. If not, she will have to accept that 100 of her children will die every day. The angels went after her finally locating her in the sea, in the powerful waters in which the Egyptians were destined to perish. They told her what God had said, and she did not want to return. And so what we have is this um, ancient attempt to do some reconciling of these different accounts in scripture through imagination. And it's it's created a whole tradition of folks who see Lilith as this strong, independent woman who did not want to lie beneath Adam, who proclaimed very clearly that she and Adam were equals, given that they were both made out of the ground. And also what this tradition has led to is um, a whole variety of stories about Lilith where she is demonized and in fact talked about as a monster. And, um, and so what's interesting in thinking about Lilith, this, this person in Jewish tradition, who um, is on the one hand seen as this strong independent woman, but then on the other hand, seen as a monster who should have submitted. I think it's, it's not hard to see resonances of how women are continually talked about today. With that, I'm going to invite you all to do a little discussing while I get my computer charger. Excuse me one second. Um, so, yeah, what do you think about that, about this tradition of Lilith and kind of reading into the scriptural text? Does it feel worthwhile? Does it feel interesting? Does it feel like an aberration? Um, talk amongst yourselves. Well, as a second wave feminist who heard about <laughs> Lilith through Lilith Fair and whatever else was going on at the time, I didn't know the real story. And I just thought it was a empowering other way of looking at Eve. And, you know, it seems like having heard what I just heard, I'm like, let's just go back to Eve <laughs> and skip the whole <laughs> Lilith because... I mean, you know, she she almost ends up in a much worse place. Uh, Why do I you mean, think that? 
It's not a hundred of her children will die every day, and she, you know, she turns into a monster. I mean, it there's it doesn't seem like things worked out so well for Lilith. Oh, you know? I didn't think it was like she turned into a monster. I thought it was just that she was made out to be a monster by people. Right. It, yeah. It, yeah, but, but all there's the you know hundred children dying every day. That's that was part of what he said, right? Right, right. Yeah, that's, I, I that's not it. admirable. I, I, I mean, wonder. to me, I don't take that literally. Well, I mean, I, to me, I just think that as like, this is the price that women have to pay for their own freedom and independence. There's great sacrifices to be made. Um, and but, I mean, and I'm as a person who does not have children, it's like, you know, um, I often see women um, not not doing things they want to do because of their children and sacrificing their whole life or existence for their children. Um, so to me, I think it's a, just a really powerful image of what a woman might have to do in order to be free. Oh, yeah. No, no, I don't, I don't agree at all. It's the patriarchy that's telling the woman she has the full responsibility for the children. Well, I think Susan's just talking about reality. <laughs> you know, that in our reality, that's how it usually works. But what I'm talking about is I thought that symbolically Lilith was this positive um, story about woman empowerment. And it, it Sounds like, and and am I to understand that Tony said this may have been a 15th century uh, writing up or imagining, but of older stories, possibly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, that, that's correct. And they, they date this text from between 700 and 1000 CE. Uh, but there, there's an idea that it, it is, in fact, kind of just a recording or an elaboration on other oral traditions that date even before then. I'm sorry, Marge, what were you just about to say? No, uh, that's what I was going to ask is how ancient are the stories of Lilith? And there are a lot of them. I mean, there are a lot of, of stories. So it's a, it is a folk tradition. Yikes. Yeah, uh, um, did we lose it? Yeah. It's a, so, yeah, those are also ancient stories. They might have gotten collected into the canon if the canon had been collected differently. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and what we're seeing here is um, whether we're thinking about Paul and his use of the creation story to help make meaning out of what Jesus's life and teachings are, or we're looking at Paradise Lost, the 17th century attempt to um, revive and refresh the creation story um, through an epic poem, or the story of Lilith, this um, ancient story that then becomes the inspiration for a whole magazine that began in the 1970s um, for Jewish women who were wanting to be Independent Jewish and frankly feminist is is the is their uh, kind of tagline. What I want to do now with just our last five minutes is I was hoping that we'd be able to do this activity together, but I'm going to invite you if you have some time and interest to just do it in between now and the next time we get together. So we all are fairly, I think, acquainted with where this story goes. We read through the beginning and the creation of all the different layers of the universe and the creation of male and female in God's image. Then in chapter two, the creation of Adam and Eve. Where does the story go? Can we just get a quick refresher? Where does this lead? They have children. The children, mm -hmm. one kills, one brother kills the other. Right. Before that, they eat fruit they're not supposed to eat. Oh, yes. Right? And so they, um, the, the serpent comes and tempts Eve into eating the fruit. 
make some logical arguments. God's not really going to kill you. You can eat this. It's fine. Eve does, then gives it to Adam. Um, and then God... No. He's just frozen. So, Tony, you froze. Alm of things. Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity, enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman, God said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then God mm. says to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. You are dust and to dust you shall return. Okay. So I was thinking that what we would do is... Um, an activity in this time, but again, given where we are, I'm going to invite you to do it on your own if you'd like. And here's the invitation. We just read what God said to the serpent, to Eve, and to Adam, but we never really hear from them, their response. And so I'm going to invite you to choose one of those beings, the serpent, Eve, or Adam, and write a response to God. Write a letter to God um, saying what you think, what you feel, where you're at, um, and, and think through to yourself, if you were in the position of being Eve or Adam or even the serpent, how might you respond to God's accusations, condemnations, just the whole situation? And then, um, if, if anyone has time or interest in doing that, the next time we get together, we can talk a little bit about it and what that process was like, what you thought of, um, what you came up with, how it felt to do that. Any questions or comments about that piece of things before we end? All right, y'all. Well, with that, I'm going to... Again, invite you, if you have time and energy and interest, to let this story be the springboard for your own imagination <laughs> as you consider how you might respond if you were any one of those characters. Um, thank you so much, as always, for your questions, your comments, your thoughts, and I look, look forward to being with you again next week. Hey, Tony, if you have five minutes, can I talk to you after this Zoom? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.